Mr. Uh, Ivo Ivanovsky, Minister for Informational Society and Administration of Republic of Macedonia. Thank you, Lord. Dear Director Ivanovsky, dear Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Pippa Fritz, welcome to Macedonia, dear regulators. Friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear media. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here one more time in Outbit for the regulatory conference. This year with a topic which is uh, very trendy, which is very hot. Machine to machine, Internet of Things, Internet of uh, Everything. Uh, when uh, Robert asked me to participate in this conference, I told him that uh, it would be a pleasure because I do remember how successful was the conference that uh, they had at the last time over here in Ovid with uh, multiple participants and I can see the numbers of country being present in Macedonia this year has increased which only proves that Macedonia and uh, our regulatory body, the Agency of Electronic Communication is uh, getting a good reputation around the world and uh, this is a tribute to all of you that have come here today and I would like to thank you for that. Now, when we talk about the machine to machine, I was able to do a short research about where is the world today and what are the telecoms around the world doing when it comes to connecting the world. I pulled up some numbers and I'll quickly go through them just to demonstrate that over 428 mobile operators do offer machine to machine M2M -M services across 187 countries, which is equivalent to about 4 out of 10 mobile operators worldwide. The highest proportion of operators offering M2M -M services in Europe, where about two thirds of the players do offer M2M. -M. This compares to just under a half of operators in Americas, Asia, and Oceania. Six out of ten operators offering M2M -M are located in developing countries, reflecting that the developing countries' operators contribute 66% of the global pool of mobile operators. GSMA intelligence estimates that operators in developing countries overtook those in the developed countries in terms of M2M -M connection last year, accounting for just over half, 52% of all M2M -M connections globally as of the last quarter. Now, we can see that in the group of countries where m m is the most offered in Europe, Sweden is leading, and maybe this is due to the fact that Marvin has been leading the Sweden regulator for a long time, followed by the New Zealand and the Finland over there, where we have the representative from Finland as well. But the statistics is uh, very interesting that shows that developing countries are using more and more than the developed countries. And uh, this is a fact that has been proven even in uh, Africa, in uh, uh, North America, in Latin America, and of course in Asia. Now, I looked up uh, Bytesnet, who is embedded electronic specialist for M2M. They have done some prediction of where this uh, sector will go in 2015, so just in the near future. The prediction number one is smart sensors. Whether we're talking about sensors of um, HVAC systems or exercise wristbands, smart sensors have been around for some time. But the expectation is that a large increase of the sensors and lowering the price of the sensors by the improvement of the technology, more and more sensors will be introduced in our daily lives. The analog sense signals transferred along lengths of wiring and parts building is out. Digital transfer of data over common buses via RF, copper, or fiber is in. The prediction number two is the platform consolidation. Developing a custom solution is very costly, complex, and potentially difficult to maintain. And today we have powerful platforms that fit into small boards and which provide an abundance of ports, as well as compatibility with modern standardized operating systems such as Android and Linux. It makes sense to get a head start on developing by using these platforms. Not only do they have a thriving developer community and abundance of documentation, but also a thriving ecosystem in compatible software and hardware tools. And of course, when it comes to the platforms, the big 
dilemma into the Internet of Things on a worldwide issue is how secure those platforms can be. We all know that the advantage of having all of your devices at home connected and where the new technology is going where the sensors will recognize your body and the temperature will change in the room, the TV will turn on in your favorite channel, the radio will lower the volume or the TV will increase the volume. But also, what happens if this technology are in the wrong hands? Meaning, what happens if the bad people know when you're in the house or you're not in the house? So this is a challenge all around the world where we are discussing the pros and the cons of the platforms. The pros, yes, maybe there is a fire in your home and while you're sleeping, the fire engine system knows and sends a signal to the fire brigade, the fire brigade comes and turns off uh, the fire or sends a signal to the emergency hospital vehicles and they come and even you don't have to call them. But also you have the negative side where again, Robbery can happen, they know you're not in the house, or they know in which room you are, in which room you're not. And this is a challenge that has been uh, discussed uh, on the ICANN platforms, on the ITU, and uh, many more discussions. I'm sure this is a constant discussion even in Brussels. And I would like to hear more if we can talk about these platforms and uh, where the future will go. The prediction number three is the industri industrial versions of development boards. Where more and more equipment is being connected through radio and remote operations, the hardware to provide this is becoming smaller and cheaper with profusion of a small but powerful development boards such as Raspberry Pi, Arduino, Beagle, WAM board, ROT board, and many others. The prediction number four is the rise of Bluetooth 4.0 low energy. Many smart devices right now are using the fourth generation of Bluetooth, which is a low energy. The iPhone has it, I know a lot of the Android new devices has it. I'm sure the general sponsor Huawei has a lot of those devices, so we've got to give them credit to them for that. And the prediction number five is the curved screens. The curved screens that uh, now we start seeing in some of the phones, but the um, LED backlighting or the OE LED displays are going to become visible on commercial level in digital advertising. We will see them in buses, we will see them in trains, Everywhere where there is a curved area instead of the poster that we see today will be probably an OLED displays with uh, communicating via the internet. And the prediction is the sector growth. The sector growth, uh, human uh, home automation, driven mostly by automated lighting and smart meters, wearable technology, following on the fitness devices and smartwatches, more specialized devices are on the horizon. They will leverage both hardware and apps to monitor long various aspects of people's lives. Transportation management, smart cars and active traffic management using vehicle location and telemetric information will provide better services and driving safety. These are some of the issues that are hot topics today. Hopefully the machine to machine in Macedonia in this region will continue to grow. We're very much uh, supportive of our telecommunication sector in Macedonia with the latest legislation that we passed uh, last year. We can see continuous mm -hmm. growth of uh, our sector and we are very much thankful to those who have continued to invest in Macedonia such as Telecom Austria, Telecom Slovenia, Deutsche Telekom and the other companies they have uh, determined to put more capex in the Republic of Macedonia with that to provide to our citizens uh, better innovations, better jobs, and a better economy for Macedonia. Thank you one more time for being here, and uh, Robert, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your inspiring speech. And now allow me to uh, introduce our next speaker, Mr. Joran Marby, Director uh, General of PTS and Vice Chair of Beric Energy for this year. Thank you. Good morning, dear colleagues, your excellence, friends. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and this, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conference. Um, because some of the areas we're going to talk about is more important than others, but I think that just having this kind of conferences and to talk about it enhances our knowledge. 
there's going to be a lot of discussions today about new business models, new ecosystems, and things that change us. Um, sometimes I think it was easier 15 years ago to be a regulator because it was voice and it was mobile and it was no internet. There were no changes in business models and there was no competition. But sometimes we have to remind ourselves where we actually started. I mean, we, young professionals, always connected peoples. Yeah, my kids call me a dinosaur, but I still see myself as very young. You shouldn't laugh for that comment, please. Um, what happened really is a big trend that we, we only see parts of the trends. But one of them, we all agree, there is a change in business models, and there are things that change. There's one thing that always stays the same, and that's actually access. And often in those discussions, when especially we young urban professional people talk about access, we, we live in a world where most of us actually have access to internet and voice and connectivities. But there's only one third of the world's population actually does. And that means that access is going to be very, very important. Over the next couple of days, we're going to talk about where the bottlenecks are. And regulators, our job is to look out for bottlenecks. But I think we can agree on one thing, as the access is the first and most important bottleneck that exists. Because it's there where you can create the monopoly. And that is actually one of the problems for, for, for the regulators. How do we make sure that people get an affordable access to internet, fixed or mobile, without creating a new monopoly? And how do we do that also to ensure that people who invest in access get a fair share of return on their investments as well? That balance is and is going to be very, very important for regulatory work. Because access to internet is, is still one of the biggest problems that exists. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to be in South America, and I had a discussion with one of my fellow regulators there, who actually pointed out a very important thing to me, that the internet is a technology that makes one of the problems in being poor go away. We rich people have always had access to information. We always have. And that's an advantage of being rich. But if you get poor people on internet, a part of that advantage for rich people disappears, and you can really make sure that people can move on in their lives and create something for themselves. And that's why access is still going to be important. The regulator's job used to be very much to even out the differences between operators. You have the old incumbents and you have the new entrants coming in. And in the starting point, all we think we did was to make sure that it was an even level playing field between the old and the new ones. Today, that has changed. Today, we're going from this investor perspective into an end user and customer perspective. Because what we're trying to achieve is always choice. We are creating choice for the end users in a world that moves very, very fast. So, the Internet of Things. There is a couple of questions I would like to add because His Excellency stole about half of my speech. Thank you very much. And by the way, I don't, if you ask the Swedish operators if they think that I'm a good regulator and therefore help them, they probably will object to you. Um, Internet of Things. There is a couple of questions that I would like to discuss during the session, which I think are important. And some of them is quite fundamental. One is simple to ask, but very hard to predict. Will it be the mobile space or the fixed space who's going to own Internet of Things? There's a lot of discussions about it's going to be 20 billion, 50 billion, or 100 billion things connected to the internet. I sometimes ask myself, how many things are there? But one thing is that most of them is going to be fixed. My refrigerator is very fixed. <laughs> Regardless of the fact that I have a teenage son, so the, the content moves around all the time. There are some other teenage parents here, I presume. On the other hand, there are things that are mobile. My car, for instance. Um, and I have an older daughter with a driving license, so I would love to have some more intelligence in my car so I actually know where it is. But the thing is that we are working on regulation and standardization. And there are two moving forces here. And one of them 
is that they want to move all traffic into the mobile network. So they terminate all mobile traffic in the mobile network. And the other one is that they move all the traffic from the mobile network into the, to the fixed network. So the mobile becomes an access to the fixed. You all know that today a lot of people is using their mobile phones on fixed networks using Wi-Fi. And then you ask yourself, what effect will this have? Very simple one. Will everything have a SIM card or not? Or the other way around, will the intelligence of the future be in the network or will the applications be intelligent in the future? And that is going to have a great impact on what we do to be able to create the environment for the Internet of Things for the next couple of years. And it's a big struggle between the network companies and the mobile companies because they both want to own this. And we probably have to find a safe path in between them, making sure that we don't give monopolies to anyone, but we still create innovation for both of them. And this is starting, we have in the IQ discussions, we have standardization discussions, there's a lot of discussions how to solve this one. And I hope that you can all help me in that in the next couple of days. And I also would like to add the privacy issue. Privacy issues are in the heart of any regulator, and it becomes more and more important as more people get connected to the internet. Well, I can throw numbers on you. As we mentioned, in Sweden today, 94% of all the banking transactions um, by consumers are done on the internet. And that's a very big fact, because I usually say when I grow up, we actually have post offices in Sweden, we don't anymore. We actually don't have post offices. Um, there is a lot of change where people are taking control for the first time of what's happening, but it creates a lot of information for other people, for for operators and also other ones and what our personal behavior on the internet. And coming to the Internet of Things when we actually connect devices as well, um, I think that privacy issues is going to be even more important. Not only driven by us, but also on the fact that we are um, the consumers will ask more and more questions. So to conclude this one, internet doesn't have any borders. In Europe right now we have a discussion called the digital single market. How do we create a digital single market? Some funny people, that's me, said that we already have a digital single market in Europe. It's called the internet. Actually, we have a worldwide digital single market. It's called the internet. That means that the internet feels no borders. And that's why this type of conferences are so important. Because in a sense as well, regardless if you're a big country, a small country, and you come into this game, or a little bit elderly, we're all beginners. We don't have all the answers to the questions. The investors doesn't have them, the policy makers doesn't have all the answers, and we regulatory, I have to admit, we don't have all the answers as well. And therefore we can all go through a conference like this and learn. And that's why I'm here. I know there are some very sharp minds in this group, and I'm really looking forward to pick their brains. So thank you again, Robert. Um, it's been so far one of the best conferences I've been to, and I'm looking forward for the next couple of days but maybe some less food, actually. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, ITU is quite active in, in trying to monitor regulation for our 193 member states. Um, many of you may be intimately familiar with our annual regulatory survey, uh, which feeds into our Trends in Telecommunication Reform report, published in six languages. And there is, of course, the Global Symposium for Regulators, which is taking part this year, uh, taking place this year in Gabon on the 9th to the 11th of June. So uh, we're very pleased that some of you will be attending that. Uh, this year we'll also see the launch of our ICT regulatory tracker. We have spent a huge amount of time and effort compiling a database with some uh, 16,000 data points, I think, for all the different regulatory measures for 122 countries over uh, the last number of years and this will be made available to those of you who wish to do benchmarking or analysis um, either for your country over the period of time or relative to uh, other countries so that, that's a very um, promising tool that we're very excited about this year. Many of you have worked with Yaroslav Honda and his team um, on regional initiatives and I'd like to mention the regulatory conference for uh, Europe in Budvar on the 28th to the 29th of September. Uh, I understand that the Internet of Things would appear to be a <laughs> major concern here. Uh, ITU published its first report on the Internet of Things in 2005, and actually I'm going to be a little controversial here, because uh, I would like to posit that uh, it hasn't really fulfilled its potential that we foresaw then. Uh, there has been some progress in connectivity, uh, connected cars and fully networked cars and security systems, but other than uh, 10 million cows in Ireland who are now tagged with RFID, practically speaking, the report that we wrote in 2005 is still, by and large, uh, ha hasn't quite fulfilled that promise. Um, that may be about to change. Uh, we're seeing much more momentum in this area now. And in fact, RTU obviously has its joint task force on Internet of Things standards to try and help uh, that market grow. And I'm working on a joint report with Cisco. And we've been interviewing a number of Silicon Valley uh, startups, um, academic projects coming out of Portland University, the University of Oxford. Um, we're very happy to share the information uh, we, we've gathered because um, it's becoming apparent that there uh, really is a just sort of many requirements that are going to be quite different in the Internet of Things and wireless sensor networks. Um, the Minister mentioned reliability, power requirements, uh, network load. But in fact, what was quite interesting for, for me was the um, Patrick Thompson of Oxford University with their Smart Pump project who was saying that contrary to what some of you might think, technical choices and trade-offs are actually some of the easier trade-offs to make. And he was emphasizing the um, uh, social and indeed ethical, I think you're using the word privacy here, but I would, I would <laughs> move it one step further to ethics, uh, trade-offs, just because he can monitor um, the location and activity of his maintenance staff in Kenya, um, does he necessarily want to? So that, that was uh, his point. Um, that tracking is, some of that tracking is probably already being done, um, and there was certainly uh, the economist mentioned that marketing companies in the US have developed one billion on you know, profiles of online digital users, which are currently being used for commercial purposes, according to the economist. Um, but of course, uh, we're all aware of the power and potential of this information. Another major area of work, um, particularly for the Broadband Commission, uh, national and ITU as a whole, uh, the national broadband plans, and we've been monitoring the growth of national broadband plans, uh, which are now held by around uh, 140 countries, we estimate, and we found that um, besides having a plan and a lot of poetry on paper, the, uh, really the more essential part is the healthy dialogue. And in this respect, I think Macedonia is doing really very well. From what I've seen, there's a lot of interchange and communication between the 
regulator, the minister and the industry. So um, I think in terms of best practices, there's definitely something that um, uh, many people can learn here. Uh, in terms of the importance of dialogue, uh, I'd just like to move to my um, summary that ITU is a membership organisation and 10 years ago when I first joined ITU there was a lot of discussion about mandate um, but I am hearing this less and less and fortunately I think we, we should be moving from mandate to the word services <laughs> the services that we provide to you our members and stakeholders and that is obviously spectrum management and allocation the definition of technical standards, and including for 5G and the Internet of Things, or indeed the work on national broadband plans and the technical capacity building and assistance. But as a membership organisation, ITU can only be as good and strong um, at our job in providing services to you as you, our members and stakeholders, make us. So I would appeal to you to bring your ideas and suggestions and your energy to ITU, uh, very much as His Excellency Minister Ivanovsky has done, or indeed Kathleen Marinsker's Chair of Council. So we're very grateful for your inputs and your energy, and uh, we would like to continue working with you to help us make sure we deliver the right services that you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>